This section is titled Differences Between Linear and Nonlinear Differential Equations. I think that title is a little bit misleading in that what this section is really about is something called an existence and uniqueness theorem. Now, the, the difference that they're talking about here is primarily the difference between the existence and uniqueness theorem for linear equations and that for nonlinear equations. So that's the difference we're going to be looking at, but it's really slightly mislabeled, I think. It, perhaps it should be called existence and uniqueness theorems for linear and nonlinear differential equations. Anyway, that aside, let's take a look at a differential equation in a format that we're pretty familiar with now. Okay, it's maybe not in a familiar format yet, but we could put it into a familiar format. And this actually serves as a really good opportunity to see that you don't always get a differential equation in a format that's ready to integrate both sides or find an integrating factor. So let's take a minute and try to get this into what some textbooks at least call standard form. And that is the form dy dt plus some function of t times y equals some other function of t. And of course we could see this as y prime plus p of t y equals g of t. So there's a couple of different versions of this differential equation in standard form. So we're going to take a minute now and put this equation into standard form. The thing that I notice here is that I want my dy over my dt, and I can't do that here because they're both on the same side of the equation. So I'm going to start by subtracting the quantity x times dy from both sides, which will give me negative x dy on the right-hand side. And now I can divide both sides by dx, and let's just, while we're at it, also divide both sides by negative x. And I have dy dx, I'm writing that on the left-hand side, equals 2 times the quantity y minus 4x squared all over negative x. That's still not quite in standard form, so let's take another minute and simplify. I have 2y over negative x minus 8x squared over negative x. That makes this negative 2 over x times y, which puts that term in this form. Minus, I'm going to have minus a negative here, right? So I'm multiplying and dividing by a negative. So I'll have plus 8x, and that's dy dx. Now that's still not quite in standard form because standard form is dy dx, or dy dt in this case, plus uh, plus a function of t times y, that's all on the left-hand side. And what I have my function of x times y is on the right-hand side. So I'm going to add the quantity 2 over x times y to both sides. dy dx plus 2 over xy equals 8x. So this equation, this differential equation, is in standard form. Now, the question we're going to ask ourselves in this section is, does this thing have a solution? Does a solution even exist? And if it does, is it the only one? I mean, if it doesn't have a solution, I don't want to spend a lot of time trying to find it. And if I've solved it and I have a solution, I don't want to spend a lot of time trying to figure out how many more solutions there might be. So this existence and uniqueness theorem is going to tell, first, tell us, first of all, whether once we have a differential equation, a, uh, a solution for that equation exists, and then if it does, is that solution unique? Is it the only one, or are there others? We're not going to uh, prove this theorem in this section. We're just going to state it and then use it. Uh, the primary reason for this, well, there are a couple of reasons. One is that there are actually two existence and uniqueness theorems in this section. One is for linear first order uh, uh, differential equations and one is for first order nonlinear equations. And I want to address both. And the other is that the textbook doesn't 
prove them at this point. It proves them later on. Right now, I just want to look at the theorems themselves and see what they say, and then talk about how to use them. So the the uh, theorem, the existence and uniqueness theorem for first order linear equations says if the functions p and g, and that's the functions p and g from our standard form, if those two functions are continuous on an open interval, well, an open interval, remember, is say on a number line. We'll put zero there. And let's say we have a uh, a value a there and a value b there. When we talk about an open interval, we mean all of the points in between a and b, but not necessarily including the value a or the value b. A closed interval would be including a and including b. So an open interval would, let me erase these, make them open circles again. Um, an open interval between a and b would be a comma b in parentheses, or a is less than, I think we're using x here. Uh, no, we're using t, so let's use t. t is somewhere between a and b, but not including a or b, right? Those are not there. Those, or equal to symbols are not there. Or you can represent this like this on a number line, and we haven't done it this way really since probably um, elementary algebra. But th these three things mean the same thing. This is a number line, this is uh, inequality notation, and this is interval notation. We tend to use interval notation because it's so compact. But I want you to remember that the difference between this and this is the same as the difference between what you see here and I color in those circles. With the circles colored in, I now have this represented on a number line. And to represent that in inequality notation, I would say A is less than or equal to T, and at the same time, T is less than or equal to B. Okay, so I'll use a highlighter here. These three, oops, wrong, wrong thing highlighted there. These three things now all mean the same thing. Whereas, different color, these three things, but with the, the circles not colored in, this is really hard to, hard to convey. I guess I should have made a separate, um, separate num number line for this. That's the blue. There's no or equal to. Okay, so when we're talking about an open interval, we mean an interval between the numbers a and b, but not including a and b, okay? Not including a and not including b. A half open interval would have uh, either a or b included, but not both. Well, we're talking about an open interval, so we don't want to include either a or b. Okay, I'm going to erase this part because I don't need that anymore. Um, but I'm going to define the open interval specifically that we're going to use in our definition here or in our theorem. The functions p and g are continuous on an open interval. We're going to call that interval i and we're going to say that it's the interval for all of our t values that goes between a and b or your textbook uses alpha and beta. So they're using the inequality notation here. I tend to prefer the interval notation but it, it really doesn't matter and it does mean the same thing so we'll go with what they've got in the textbook. If you're using a different textbook as you watch these videos you may find that your uh, textbook uses this notation instead. It just depends on the author. One other thing to clarify is that the interval doesn't have to be on either side of zero, right? Your interval could be from A to B or it could be from A to B. So that's an important thing to take into consideration. And our interval is going to contain the point containing the point t equals t naught. I remember as an undergraduate really struggling with some of the notation that gets thrown at you at, in this sort of level of math class. We start assuming that you kind of have a, a 
pretty high level grasp on some fundamental assumptions that we're making. And I don't necessarily feel like we should make those assumptions. Let me see what I can do to clarify this particular one. T equals T naught, T equals T sub zero. What does that mean? Well, I have an interval, an open interval between the value alpha and the value beta. And all of the values in that open interval are some value of t. So t equals 1, t equals 10, t equals negative 7, t equals 0 0.7365, uh, t equals the square root of 13, right? We don't know necessarily what a and or alpha and beta are. Uh, that's intentional. We're, we're intentionally being very general, very vague with what our values are. But we do know this is an open interval. And what we're saying by this open interval contains the point t equals t naught is that one of the values in there is some number, and we're going to call it not just any old t, but this specific t. And so t equals 1, t equals 2, t equals 10, t equals t naught. t naught is just a value. It's a specific value, even though it's an unknown value. t can be anything in this particular case. It happens to be this number right here. So when we say t naught, and this is something else to sort of throw at you, another assumption that often gets made, t naught represents the, the input value for essentially the beginning of, uh, how do I want to put this? Beginning of the experiment, at the beginning of uh, the moment when you start your stopwatch, right? It's the initial, it's the time at which you make the initial observation. Now that's often zero, but not always, okay? So when we say t equals t naught, we just mean that the specific value, unknown value of t is somewhere between alpha and beta. And it has to be between alpha and beta. It can't be equal to alpha or equal to beta because it's an open interval that contains this point t naught. Okay, so that's what that means. Okay, I've moved my little number line down rather than erasing it all together because I think it's going to come ha in handy in a, in a minute. Um, the next thing I want to point out is when we're stating a theorem here, um, we have this this statement up here, this clause, I would call it in, in an English class, I would call this a clause. If the functions P and G are continuous on an open interval containing the point, if all of those conditions are met, then the following is true. In other words, in order for this theorem to hold water, as it were, uh, the statement that I'm about to make down here, this, this thing that I'm going to claim down here, is actually reliant on the fact that all of these conditions up here are met. If they're not, then I can't say what I'm about to say down here. So we have to assume that P and G are continuous functions. Let's draw a quick graph of what I mean that by that. We have a t-axis and a y-axis. And uh, let's say that we have some function uh, g of t, and it is it is continuous at least between alpha and beta. Okay, so this is my function g of t, and I've intentionally drawn a funky, weird, abstract thing. Um, it's a continuous function. That's all that really matters at this point. It's continuous between alpha and beta. And let's draw a function um, p of t. And I'm actually going to draw a discontinuous function. But if it's discontinuous out here, for example, or out here, that doesn't matter. As long as it's continuous between alpha, and it is, and beta between alpha and beta. Uh, P of t is also, I've labeled it in the wrong place, haven't I? This is P of t up here. P of t and G of t both have to be continuous, but they only have to be continuous between, but not including, alpha and beta. Okay, that's what this is saying here. Functions P and G are continuous on an open interval, and that the point t naught has to also be in that interval. If both of those things are true, then there exists a function phi of t. All right, we have p of t and g of t. If they're continuous on an open interval, and that interval contains this point, then there's a function 
phi of t that satisfies the differential equation in this form, dy dt plus p of t y equals g of t. So this statement here, if the functions p and g are continuous, is building up to this. We started out by reminding ourselves what a differential equation in standard form looked like. But starting here, we're building up to, if we have two continuous functions on this open interval, and that interval contains this point, then we can say there exists a function p of t that satisfies the differential equation in this form. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that if the functions p and g are continuous, and in my example over here, p of t would be 2 over x, g of t would be 8x. If those are continuous on some open interval between alpha and beta, then this thing has a solution, and that solution is going to be y equals some new function. This one's going to be in terms of x. Okay. If these two functions are continuous over an open interval, then this equation has a solution of the form v of x. That's what this is saying. Now, there's another word we can stick in here. I've left space for it. Not only does a uh, uh, solution exist, but that solution is unique. There exists a unique function, phi of t. So once I find the solution to this thing, phi of, phi of x in this case, which once I find what y is, then I know I found the only solution. That's what this theorem is saying. Now, it goes on to say that a unique function exists that satisfies this equation and it satisfies it, this y value, y equals theta of t, satisfies this equation for every value of t in the open interval. For every value of t in that interval. Now let's think about what that means for a second. There is a, there is a function, theta of t, that is, this, when I say it satisfies this differential equation, I mean that it's a solution to this differential equation. And it's a solution to this differential equation for every value of t in here. I can pick any t I want, including this one, including t naught, t sub zero, and that t value will, that t value in phi, in phi rather, will still be an answer to this. This is a y value, right? If I plug a t value in here, let's let's plug one in from maybe here. Plug that into to phi, and it it spits out a y value. And that y, y equals phi, to, sorry, y equals phi of that t value, or of a different t value in here, y equals phi of, of t is going to is going to answer this question. It's going to work here. If you take its derivative, it's going to work. It's going to satisfy this equation, right? That's what that means. And it doesn't have to be t sub zero. It can be anything. So why did we specify t sub zero? Well, it turns out that this function phi of t satisfies this differential equation as long as these conditions are met. And it also satisfies the initial condition y, wrong color of pen, y evaluated at t naught equals y naught. This is an initial condition. If I plug in my initial t value, I get my initial y value out. So not only does a solution to this differential equation exist, it's called phi of t, as long as this, these conditions are met, a solution exists. It's a unique solution, right? So once I know what that is, I know it's the only one. And also, so, so that part right here, if I, if I cross this part out, or if I erase this part here, what I've got up to this point is the equivalent of saying there is a unique general solution. And if I then write back in here that it also satisfies this initial condition, then that's an even stronger statement, right? I have a general solution, v of t, and if I have initial conditions, this phi of t still meets those requires. It still satisfies or also satisfies those initial conditions. Um, I'm going to erase my, my number line here because I need to specify that 
y of 0, y sub 0, not y of 0, y sub 0. Uh, y sub 0 is just an arbitrary prescribed initial value. And that just means that uh, this value right here, I can tell you in, in advance what I want that number to be. And given that as long as these conditions are met, this differential equation has a solution. I can find that solution. I know it's unique. The general solution is unique to uh, up to a constant. And then I can also satisfy this initial condition for some Pre, uh, previously determined y not value. So you tell me what y not value you want, and I'll be able to tell you which t value to plug into this function y equals c of t that gives you that. That's like saying if I know what the initial conditions are, I can tell you what the c is. I can give you the particular solution. Okay, now I'm going to erase some of this side. So if you need another minute to uh, write down what's on this side of the screen, go ahead and pause the video. And when you come back, we will do a little racing, and then I'm going to use my originally uh, formatted differential equation to do some other stuff. Well, I'm going to use both of them. But okay, um, let's erase. Let's see. I, I'm going to erase this this part of my number or this little number line I have down here. I'll erase this for now, and I'll erase uh, all the work I did to get to that point. In fact, I think what I'll do is copy this down, dy dx, dy dx plus 2 over x equals, oops, times y equals 8x. And then I can get rid of this, and I have this originally formatted differential equation and its standard form written here. So what this theorem tells me now is when I look at this equation, especially if it's in this form, I know that a solution exists. Not only that, but I know that when I find that solution, I can stop. I don't have to keep looking for additional solutions. That solution is unique. Furthermore, if I have some initial conditions, let's say y of 1 equals 4, then I'm also guaranteed to be able to find a particular solution to this differential equation once I know its general solution. I can do that fairly quickly. I can find an integrating factor e to the power of the integral 2 over x dx. I'm not going to do this in real time. I'll take a few steps and, and write them down, but I'm going to pause the video uh, recording in between so that we don't take up too much video time doing this, because by now you should be able to do these. But I'll, I'll step you through and show you the solution to this equation, but that's not really the point of this particular lesson, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. Here's my setup for finding the integrating factor. When I do the arithmetic, the calculus, and the algebra, I end up with kx squared, absolute values. I only need one, so I pick x squared. The integrating factor is x squared. Now I'll distribute that through and simplify and then combine the left hand side into a derivative. So remember this is the product rule in reverse. And lastly I'll take the derivative of, or sorry, the, the integral of both sides with respect to x. I guess I shouldn't say lastly. I should probably almost never say lastly, right? I can simplify this. And that gives me x squared y equals 2x to the fourth plus c. Now I could divide both sides of that by x squared, and I would get y equals 2x squared plus c over x squared. So uh, I've got two different versions of my solution here. I have this one here, and I have this one here. They're both correct. It just sort of depends on the, it, in, in part it depends on how you're going to use it next. And we don't really know. Right now we're just working on these almost as, as an exercise, you know, finding a solution. But now what I want to do is having, having spelled out what the uh, theorem says, 
and having taken an example of a differential equation, knowing because of the theorem, knowing that a solution exists, we sort of satisfied our curiosity about what that solution might be. I want to go back to the theorem and use it to describe the interval in which the original problem, this initial value problem here, the interval over which it has a solution. Okay, so instead of solving the differential equation, I want to find the interval over which this initial value problem has a solution. In other words, we know that the functions p and q are continuous over a particular interval, right? This function a of x is just a line. y equals a of x, uh, sorry, y equals 8x is just a line. So that's continuous everywhere. But this function, my function p of x, is only continuous where there's no gap, break, uh, or asymptote, vertical asymptote, in the graph of this function. So the interval over which this has a solution is dependent on where these two functions are continuous. Right? What is the interval? What are a and b? Um, what are the endpoints of the interval over which this function is continuous? So let's go take a look at that. Um, where should I do that? I think I'll erase this so that I can leave the theorem here and I'm going to draw a new number line or a new graph up here. Okay, I hope you remember what the graph of y equals 1 over x looks like. It goes through 1, 1 and negative 1, negative 1. See if I can draw that without shaking. There we go. This is the graph of 1 over x. Very rough sketch. It's, you know, all we really need. Um, to get the graph of y equals 2 over x, I'm going to multiply that by 2. I'm going to stretch it by 2 for every x value. My y value is doubled. For x equals 2, I'm at 1. So this graph looks something like this. Eventually it becomes asymptotic at the same places as the graph of y equals 1 over x is asymptotic. The x and y axes, it's not shifted to the left or right or up or down. So I have a horizontal, as a horizontal asymptote of the, of the x-axis and a vertical asymptote of the y-axis. Now, what are the intervals over which this function is continuous. Well, it continues, I, both of them, but I'm looking at the, uh, the yellow graph, y equals 2 over x, uh, continues in this direction forever. It reaches a horizontal asymptote. There are no more breaks in the graph. The domain to the left of this is infinite, and the domain to the right of this is infinite. But here, there's a break in the graph, right? The graph never touches that vertical line. So I need to say, that the interval over which the, the yellow graph here is continuous is negative infinity up to zero, zero up to infinity. Notice that these are both open intervals. And all together, I can say, I can make this a union, right? There, there's only, uh, one gap in the graph and it's at zero. You can see that the, the zero Immediately to the right of zero, we're okay. Immediately to the left of zero, but zero itself is left out. And this is one big domain, and I have to use this kind of notation to indicate there's a gap in it. Now, the thing is, we have an initial condition. And because we satisfied our curiosity here about what the solution, the general solution to the differential equation was, it's tempting to plug the uh, x and y values of 1 and 4 into this and find out what the particular solution is. And I could do that, but I don't need to. In order to find the interval over which this thing has a solution, what I need to do is look at where the initial condition takes place. Is x equals 1 in this part of my interval or in this part of my interval? And the answer is it's in this part. So that means that actually this equation only has a solution somewhere waiting for my highlighter to load here, somewhere in this interval, not in the other part of the interval. If this had been different initial conditions, if this had been y 
of negative one equals negative four, then I would have used the other part of the interval. But because I was given this, inter um, this initial condition, I know my, um, my interval over which I'm interested, the interval over which I'm working is from zero to infinity. What's interesting about this theorem is that I don't need to do any of this work in order to answer the question, is there a function that satisfies? Is there a solution? Uh, yes, there is, right? As long as P and G, as long as these, sorry, as long as this function and this function are continuous function, continuous functions over some interval, then yes, I will be able to find an answer. A differential equation has a solution if these conditions are met. It's a unique solution. Once I found it, it's the only one. And furthermore, this statement here that it that it also that my my answer right also satisfies this tells me what the interval is this this open interval is okay the next part of this section is the un existence and uniqueness theorem for, for first order nonlinear equations because this video is already so long i'm going to leave this one where it is and i'm going to make a part two so in the next video, we'll be talking about the existence and uniqueness theorem for first order nonlinear differential equations. And hopefully that video won't be quite so long.